This weekend marked Armistice Day in Great Britain and Veterans Day in the United States. Both are somber days typically marked by honor and respect for symbols of the country and for the men and women who have sacrificed so much for the country. This weekend instead, both London and New York City featured terrorist supporters marching en masse through the censors of the West, proclaiming their sovereignty. Marxist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre once blustered that the West was so guilty for its colonization, the best path would be colonization in reverse. Quote, it's our turn to tread the path step by step, which leads down to native level. But to become natives altogether, our soil must be occupied by a formerly colonized people, and we must starve of hunger. This won't happen, said Sartre. Sartre was wrong. He, along with his like-minded and soft-headed colleagues, helped to discredit the West so thoroughly that the West spent decades importing millions of people who despise it. And so London this weekend saw radical Muslims threatening the open annihilation of Jews. Death to all the Jews, right in the middle of them all. And um, talking about how much they love Hitler. If the West feels so sorry for the Israeli Zionists, why don't they give a place in Germany? Why don't they go to Hitler's back garden and make an occupation there? Then they will know what kind of people these are. Why every so many hundred years, the Zionists get slaughtered? Because Hitler knew how to deal with these people. They probably made a program so they can create a, a state of Israel in the expense of Palestinian Muslims' blood. And they chanted, Chaybar Chaybar al Yehud, which of course is a reference to the Quranic incident in which Muhammad slaughtered an entire Jewish village. <laughs> This weekend saw homegrown or imported radicals wearing the headgear of terrorist group Hamas. These are literally protesters with Hamas headbands on them, which is a crime in Britain. And it saw these pro-Hamas protesters attempting to mob the current Secretary of State for housing, Michael Gov. This is a giant crowd of pro-Hamas protesters who are following a member of the government. The police are trying to spirit this member of government away. At least 150 people were arrested, but there were 300,000 marching in solidarity with an actual terrorist group. There was one banner in particular that stood out. It reads, you're either on the white or the right side of history. Where it says white, this banner, it shows four flags, the Israeli flag, the American flag, the UK flag, and the French flag. Where it says right, it shows a bunch of Arab flags, it shows a bunch of African flags, again, white or right. This, in a nutshell, is the philosophy of those who march with Hamas and against the West. The West is powerful. The West has exploited. The West is white. Therefore, the West is powerful because the West is white and exploitative. The right thing to do is to side with Franz Fanon's wretched of the earth. The flags here, by the way, are apparently the flags of Congo, Sudan, the Palestinians, and the Uyghur flag. None of those places are particularly free or well-governed, and they don't have much that unifies them other than they are not white. And yet the wrong side of history is apparently Israel, the U.S., the U.K., and France. That same philosophy extends to this side of the water. Here is a flyer that's been making the rounds at the University of Chicago. As you can see, if you can watch this, the anti-Semitism on this flyer is directly linked with anti-whiteness. This flyer says ending white privilege starts with ending Jewish privilege. The idea is that the Jews are ultimately white people. They are unduly successful, and therefore they must be stopped. The poster shows a pyramid. And it shows the 1% is is the 1% straight white men or is the 1% Jewish, says this flyer handed out at the University of Chicago. This notion is fully coincident with anti-Americanism. America, after all, is largely great because of the promise that anyone of any background can get ahead. Jewish Americans are one of the great success stories in American history by that standard, given the fact that they arrived mostly in the early 20th century in the United States, dirt poor, and quickly became highly educated and economically successful. The current anti-Semitic movement is linked directly to hatred for this country and its meritocratic promise. That's why pro-Hamas protesters spent this weekend in the United States ripping down American flags. This was in New York City. You can see a man climbing up the flagpole on East 43rd Street and tearing down American flags, leaving Palestinian flags up there, tearing down those American flags. Got to make sure that those don't stay up. And people cheering wildly. Where are the police? No one knows. Dressed like a terrorist, by the way. 
Across the world, those who have not achieved are uniting against the West. They blame the West for their lack of success while living off the West's largesse. That's why Uber pampered, Uber celebrated, dullard, complete moron Greta Thunberg spent her weekend linking climate change with support for Hamas, as though Islamic terrorists worry tremendously about solar panels rather than, you know, burning Jewish babies alive. We have not been listening. The people in power have not been listening. I have come here for a climate demonstration, not a political view. That is an environmentalist coming up to Greta Thunberg trying to take away the microphone because she's ranting nonsensically about Gaza. And then she's being stopped by a bunch of women wearing kafia, And he gets dragged away. So that she can continue to jabber about the Gaza Strip. No climate justice on occupied land. No climate justice on occupied land. This obnoxious idiot child who's no longer a child, so we can make fun of her now. She has been feted. She has been treasured by the West for years to be a completely destructive, moronic force. The West has a choice. It can be colonized in Sartre's fashion, or it can refuse that colonization. In the UK, that battle is taking place largely over the verbiage of Suella Braverman. She was the former Home Secretary. We'll get to that in a moment. She has been stalwartly calling for an end to the police and the government's coddling of pro-Hamas ralliers. Over the weekend, she tweeted, quote, Our brave police officers deserve the thanks of every decent citizen for their professionalism in the face of violence and aggression from protesters and counter protesters in London yesterday. That multiple officers were injured doing their duty is an outrage. She continued, the sick, inflammatory and in some cases clearly criminal chants, placards and paraphernalia openly on display at the march mark a new low. Anti-Semitism and other forms of racism together with the valorizing of terrorism on such a scale is deeply troubling. This can't go on. Week by week, the streets of London are being polluted by hate, violence, and anti-Semitism. Members of the public are being mobbed and intimidated. Jewish people in particular feel threatened. Further action is necessary. Now, Braverman isn't white. She's of Indian extraction. But that, of course, doesn't matter. She doesn't imbibe from the well of pseudo-victimhood. And thus, she's an enemy to be destroyed. And because Braverman made the unfortunate mistake of telling the truth, she has now been summarily fired from her job. Noticing the predations of those who love Hamas is a dismissible offense in the UK. In the words of Neil Basu, a former head of counterterrorism policing in the UK, quote, you have a chance of inflaming both sides when you make such divisive remarks. Yes, it was the remarks that were divisive, not the hundreds of thousands of people calling for the destruction of Israel and the West from the heart of London. And it's both sides that might be inflamed. You know, those very, very dangerous Jews in London who might be inflamed. Mustn't defend, you know. Braverman's ouster brought back to power former Prime Minister David Cameron as Foreign Secretary. An amazing change of events. He is a foreign policy squish who stood against Brexit and had to resign from office when he lost. Cameron has shown himself perfectly willing to speak words of appeasement to Muslim radicals. In 2010, he labeled Gaza a, quote, prison camp while in Turkey, which is a, you know, Islamic dictatorship, and suggested that Israel had to open up Gaza's borders while Hamas was in charge, criticizing Israel for stopping a shipment of weapons from Turkey to the Gaza Strip. After all, fair play for terrorists and all that. In the United States, that battle is taking place at the universities, where enemies of the country are ushered in and offered scholarships at our top institutions of higher learning. The latest iteration comes courtesy of MIT, where radical students violated the university's rules by occupying public places they were not allowed to occupy. Jews were then told by the university not to enter through main areas due to safety concerns. Now, these pro Hamas students are foreigners. The university could have easily suspended them. They didn't, in violation of their own rules. Why not? Well, it would violate their scruples about the necessity of importing people into the United States who hate the United States. The university president openly stated, quote, because we later heard serious concerns about collateral consequences for the students, such as visa issues, we have decided as an interim action that the students who remained after the deadline will be suspended from non-academic campus activities. The students who remain enrolled at MIT and will be able to attend academic classes and labs. See, it turns out that if these people were suspended and they hate the United States, then theoretically, they would be eligible for deportation. And we wouldn't want terror supporters deported. That might open a slot at MIT to like, you know, an Asian American or something. The MIT student Hamas supporters, they celebrated, as you'd expect, giant rally yesterday. They tried to use it on international shame. And they're cheering that they won. 
They didn't end up suspended because the university decided the United States must have foreigners who hate the country here. Must. It has to happen. These people know that the weakness of the West means living off the fat of the land while seeking to undermine the very society that humors their garbage. The reality is that the West has created wildly disproportionate prosperity and freedom over the course of its history compared with other civilizations. That doesn't excuse the West's sins. It does mean that tearing down the West in favor of supposed alternatives is disgusting and repulsive. If the West is an aging lion, those who seek to tear it down are scavengers, relying on that lion for their livelihood and their well-being, but seething with envy and hatred. Either the Western lion will roar again or the scavengers will tear it to pieces. That is the choice we face. In just one second, we'll get to the latest from the Middle East and the great lies that are being told by our media, of course. First, Obviously, we are facing serious economic turmoil. We have international economic turmoil. We have domestic economic turmoil. We are blowing out the debt here in the United States to unprecedented levels. More spending will inevitably devalue the dollar. It's time to protect your savings by diversifying into gold with the help of Birch Gold Group. When you open an IRA with Birch Gold, for every $10,000 you spend by December 22nd, Birch Gold will send you a free gold bar. Just text Ben to 989898 to claim eligibility before Black Friday. Birch Gold can even help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into an IRA in gold without taking any money out of pocket. And you still get those free gold bars. With an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied customers, you can count on Birch Gold to help you transition an existing IRA or 401k into an IRA in gold. Don't let your savings fall victim to the further devaluation of the dollar. Text Ben to 989898. Receive a free info kit on gold. Claim your eligibility before Black Friday to receive free gold bars on your qualifying purchase. That's Ben to 989898 to get started again. Text Ben to 989898 to get started with my friends over at Birch Gold. Also, Bond Charge, it's a great company. It's a holistic wellness brand with a huge range of evidence-based products aimed at optimizing your life in every single way. Bone Charge products, they help you sleep better, perform better, recover faster, reduce inflammation, and lots more. From blue light glasses to red light therapy, Bone Charge helps you naturally address the issues of our modern day way of life effortlessly and with maximum impact. If you haven't already checked out the infrared sauna blanket from Bone Charge, you need to. The infrared sauna blanket has all kinds of benefits. It works by using infrared light, which heats the body directly rather than the air around you like a traditional sauna, which means you get the same benefits at a lower heat and you don't have to sit in some weird room with a bunch of sweaty dudes. Instead, the infrared sauna blanket will raise your heart rate to that of physical exercise. You can burn calories while you relax. It basically is a sauna, but at home. Bond Charge ships worldwide, offers exceptional customer service, comes with a 12-month warranty. Head on over to bondcharge.com slash Ben. Use code Ben to save 15%. That's B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E dot com slash Ben. Use code Ben to save 15% off. Okay, so the great lie that is now being told by enormous numbers of members of the media is the lie that the violations of human rights that have happened in the Gaza Strip are somehow the result of Israeli policy as opposed to the results of Hamas terrorism. There are a a wide variety of narratives that are now being trotted out by soft-headed morons in the West in order to try and protect Hamas or to pretend a moral equivalence that allows them to go back to sleep and pretend that the problems that exist in the streets of London don't actually exist. See, the thing is, if you can pretend a moral equivalence between Israel and its enemies, then that allows you to go back to your isolationist view of foreign policy in which things that happen very far away aren't happening at home. But you will notice that a lot of those things are happening at home. It tends to wake you up to foreign policy when you got 300,000 people chanting for Hamas on the streets of London or when you have tens of thousands of them in the United States or when you have American campuses honeycombed with people who love Hamas. It tends to open your eyes to the consequences of a morally relativistic policy when it comes to foreign policy. And so better to go back to sleep. And so there are a bunch of members of the media who are desperately attempting to do this routine. The BBC more than anyone else, because the problem is really, really big in London, much bigger than it is in the United States. The United States has a problem of Islamic radicals living here. But as a percentage of the general population, Islamic radicals are not a huge percentage of the American population. I mean, the fact is that the number of Muslims in the United States is approximately three and a half million. Obviously, not all those people are radicals. So you're talking about a very small percentage. However, when you're talking about Muslims in the UK, you are talking about 7% of the country in England and Wales. You're not 15% of London when you're talking about Muslims. And a huge percentage of those by polling data are not only anti-Israel, they're wildly anti-Semitic. And obviously by the numbers, very much pro-protecting Hamas. You can either look that in the face or you can deny that it's a problem at all. And the easiest thing to do is to fire Suella Braverman and pretend that it's not a problem at all. 
Now, in order to establish that it's not a problem, what you have to do is you have to pretend that Israel is the real problem in the Middle East. The BBC has been doing this nonstop. The BBC is basically just an Arabist outlet on behalf of pro-terrorism forces in the Middle East. That's what they are. That's what they've become. They're pathetic. Perfect example yesterday. So the BBC did an interview with Elon Levy, who is the Israeli government spokesman. And this interview is perfectly insane because Elon Levy points out that when civilians are dying in Gaza, it's because Hamas is hiding behind civilians, that Israel is targeting military targets, and Hamas is deliberately attempting to massively increase the civilian casualty numbers in order so they can go to the morons at the BBC and claim that Israel ought to pursue a ceasefire. This BBC anchor responds to that claim by saying it is convenient for Israel somehow, that it's convenient for Israel to make the argument that they're bombing military targets. Now, again, let me just remind everybody, Israel has complete military superiority in this area. Israel has complete air superiority. Hamas doesn't have, thank God, any F-16s. Israel could, if it wanted to, turn the entire place to rubble. It could turn the entire place to glass. It could kill millions of people. Instead, Israel is purposefully targeting, not only that, we'll show you evidence in just a second, that they are attempting to take care of Palestinian civilians in a way that Hamas actively is attempting to stop. But here is the BBC line, because this is what they do. It's a convenient response, isn't it, that every time there is an Israeli strike on some sort of facility inside Gaza, you just tell us that Hamas is operating there and that's why you're fighting back. We understand no, I'm that. Sorry. No, the no, UN no, I'm here, sorry. though, is saying that its facility, the UN, internationally recognized body, the UN says that its facility in Gaza was attacked by your forces overnight and this morning reporting a significant number of deaths. The point no, is no, that I'm is sorry. in the contravention no, to, of international humanitarian law and people need somewhere that is safe to go. If you are telling them to evacuate evacuate from the north of Gaza. I have to push back because the insinuation in your question is that Israel takes pleasure at taking pot shots at civilian facilities. That's not we what I'm saying. I'm just saying that every response you make to my suggestion that you are targeting people when they are trying to find somewhere safe to go because is that you not. tell me Hamas is operating there. This is because a UN facility. Ben, Hamas has spent the last 16 years embedding itself underneath civilian areas in Gaza, building its headquarters under the hospital, exploiting ambulances, putting its own, you know, our troops have just discovered rocket launchers and weapon silos inside schools, inside classrooms, next to children's bedrooms. So that We're justifies attacking those targets, even though there are, as we've seen this morning, babies in the hospital. We've seen that innocent civilians are in the UN facilities. And we are doing everything we can, going above and beyond our obligations under international law to get civilians out of harm's way. Look at the media. Look, look at the BBC there. Look at the BBC. What Alan Levy there is saying is 100 percent true. Clearly 100 percent true when he says that the U.N. facilities have been used for a very long time by Hamas as staging grounds for their terrorism and as storage points for their weaponry. Then the BBC guys, well, isn't it convenient then? That you're attacking those UN facilities as civilian. He's like, they're not civilian targets. They're military targets deliberately placed among civilians, which makes them military targets. And he said, well, isn't that convenient since you do want to obviously get, he's like, we don't want to kill civilians. He's like, but don't you really? Because you're Jews, you Jews and you're killing of the civilians. We can see what you're doing. You dirty, nasty Jews, you. I mean, it's just disgusting. It's vile. And this sort of moral equivalence comes in softer form as well. So listen, I'm friendly with Piers Morgan. And some of Piers' coverage on this conflict has been good. And some, some other parts of his coverage have been purely bad because he tends to fall into this moral equivalence nonsense. So there was a picture that emerged from Al-Shifa Hospital of small babies who are having trouble. The reason they're having trouble is because babies should not be at Al-Shifa Hospital. Israel has offered to get the babies out of Al-Shifa Hospital. Al-Shifa Hospital is a front for terrorism. It has the headquarters of the military under it. It has for 10 years. It's been reported by the New York Times, the Washington Post, Amnesty International. Hey, they keep, they, they put vulnerable children literally on top of their military headquarters in order to protect them. And Piers Morgan tweets out, this is so heartbreaking. Dozens of newborn babies detached from their incubators at Al-Shifa Gaza Hospital due to power oxygen running out. Israel must do more to get them to safety and medical treatment ASAP. Israel has offered whatever it can do to get those babies out. In fact, yesterday, here was Israel openly offering, this is their military spokesman person, offering openly to facilitate the exit of those children. Hamas does not want the kids to leave. Hamas wants the dead babies. To imply that it's Israel that has the responsibility for the babies, that Hamas is almost literally strapping to their own bodies is insane. Here's Israel's military spokesperson explaining this yesterday. We're speaking directly and regularly with the hospital staff. The staff of the Shifa hospital 
has requested that tomorrow we will help the babies in the pediatric department to get to a safer hospital. We will provide the assistance needed. And there's something that the world must not forget, and we will not let the world forget it. Hamas has been holding hostages, 239 men, women, children, elderly, and babies. Don't forget babies for 36 days. This is a crime against humanity, and we will not let the world forget it. Okay, of course, that's true. But that didn't stop the media from trying to create this false moral equivalence. Why? Because that way they can appear tolerant. They can appear sweet as the reverse colonization from places that hate America and hate the West happen. That is the goal. We'll get to more of this in just one second because it is truly, it is truly maddening. The tape is out there, but the media just don't want to see it. First, if you own a firearm, you need to check out Stopbox USA. They just introduced the Stopbox Pro. This new safe is the most reliable, secure place for your firearm. The Stopbox Pro is larger, stronger, more versatile, crafted from durable glass reinforced polycarbonate ABS. It's not just tough, it's smart. You don't want to be fumbling with keys or electronic codes in high-stress situations. The Stopbox Pro's patented hand gesture code lock allows quick, intuitive access without batteries or electronics. They understand the critical balance between security and accessibility, which is why the Stopbox Pro is designed to be low-profile and portable as well. Whether you're at home or traveling, your firearm remains concealed, secure, but readily accessible. Stopbox Pro has an expanded range of 81 combination possibilities, making it more customizable than ever. Plus, an enhanced surface texture gives you a better grip, and an improved locking mechanism is a breeze to operate. So obviously, if you have kids in the home and you also have a firearm in the home, really important that you have a really good safe for your, for your guns. Don't compromise on safety or accessibility. Visit StopboxUSA.com. Use promo code BEN for 10% off your order. Experience the peace of mind Stopbox brings. That's StopboxUSA.com. Use promo code BEN for 10% off your order today. Okay, so when we talk about the human rights lie that is being propagated by virtually everyone in the media and half of Western governments, it is in fact a lie. There is so much tape that is fully available of Hamas violating human rights and of Israel attempting to honestly overcome Hamas's attempts to violate human rights. It's totally crazy. So, for example, when Israel has been complaining that when they ship aid in, Hamas steals all of it, it's because Hamas steals all of it. For example, yesterday, a bunch of aid was shipped into the Gaza Strip and Hamas immediately started unloading the aid and stealing it. You can see people in this particular video attempting to get to the food aid. They want the food aid. They're hungry. And you can see in this video, giant crowd of people attempting to get to the truck and Hamas is beating them off the truck. You can see it in the background, far back in the background. You can see Hamas literally smacking people and trying to get them out of there so that they can steal all of the aid. This is what they do. I mean, there, there's no secret about this. Hamas has been openly doing this for literally years. They took every dollar that came in and they built it into terror tunnels and rockets. And meanwhile, there's been all this fuss about Al-Shifa Hospital because again, Hamas deliberately planted their military headquarters beneath a hospital that has like a place for ailing babies. So yesterday, Israel presented fuel to Al-Shifa, specifically to the hospital administrators at Al-Shifa. In fact, here is video of Israelis who are carrying, this is the middle of a war. Have you ever heard of anything like this? I've never even remotely heard of anything like this. IDF soldiers, literally in the middle of a war, knowing this is a military target, dropped off canisters of fuel for hospital authorities in order so they could use it to maintain power supply for people who need it in the hospital. They drop off these, these tanks. You can see there's aerial footage. Here they are. They're dropping them off. You can see all of it. And then Hamas prevented the gas from getting to the hospital. Hamas stopped it. Here's a senior Gazan health official. And he says, there's a problem at Shifa because Israel is trying to give us fuel and Hamas is preventing it. And then Pierce Morgan said, well, Israel must do more. Listen, I like Pierce, but I don't know what the hell he's talking about. What exactly are they supposed to do? Airdrop the fuel? I don't, do they have magic powers? I don't know when Israel's military was granted the magical ability to do anything that is like the impossible. Israel can magically snap its fingers and every terrorist dies and every civilian is preserved. Israel can magically snap its fingers and the fuel goes into Al-Shifa, but doesn't get into the hands of Hamas. Here's a senior Gazan health official acknowledging that Hamas is stealing the fuel and or preventing it from getting to the hospital in the first place. This is a call between a coordination liaison officer and a senior official in the health system in Gaza. The Gazan health official says there's a problem only at Shifa now. But bear with me. He says, what's the story? Abu Rish, the director general of the Hamas health ministry, doesn't want this amount of fuel. We're trying to convince him. He doesn't want that fuel in there. The New York Times, by the way, confirms this story. 
that Hamas is blocking fuel from entering Al-Shifa. Why? So they can show pictures that Piers Morgan can tweet it out and people in the media can say Israel must do more to protect civilians. This is the entire game. This is the entire game. Okay. And this combines with a secondary narrative. The secondary narrative is this idea that somehow Israel is violating the laws of war. That's an absurdity. There's no country on earth that has pursued the kinds of measures that Israel is currently pursuing in order to preserve the civilian population of that was governed by an enemy. Certainly, the United States has not done that. The United States did not do this in Iraq. The United States did not do this in Afghanistan. No country has ever done this so far as I'm aware. That's not just me. CNN military analysts say that. That's what's so crazy. And yet, there is a New York Times opinion article today by a person named Dr. Walter A. Dorn, a professor of defense studies at the Royal Military College of Canada in Kingston, Ontario. And he says that this war that Israel is waging against Hamas violates just war theory. Now, you say to yourself, how is that even possible? How is it possible that if a, a government of, of an enemy attacks your population, kills 1,200 people, abducts another 240, and then you go in to root them out, how does that violate just war theory? Well, let this professor, this very wise professor, explain. He says, the standard elements in assessing whether a, just, a war is just are just cause, right intent, legitimate authority, net benefit or likelihood of success, last resort, proportionality of means, and non-combatant distinction. Ideally, a state should meet all of the criteria, but the case for a just war can still be made even if a few of the benchmarks are weak. Israel easily has just cause and constitutes a legitimate authority, but its case is far weaker regarding the other five criteria. In addition, the fact that Hamas has violated these principles does not absolve Israel from an obligation to live up to higher moral standards. Ah, there it is. Israel has to live up to moral standards that literally no other country on earth would pursue because this moron professor from Canada says so. He says, to determine just how unjust or just Israel's current actions are, let's examine each criterion based on the approach in my scholarship. On the first measure, just cause, Israel would seem to have plenty of that. Right intent, the second criterion, means that force should be used to help establish peace in the long term rather than in pursuit of a short term or politically self-serving gain or in an act of vengeance. He says, though some might argue Israel is fighting to establish peace in Gaza from a position of strength and dominance, Israel's actions can easily be questioned. Why? Well, because Benjamin Netanyahu, he is too right wing. What the? F so, by the way, I'll just point out here, Yair Lapid, who is a center-left opponent of Netanyahu, Benny Gantz, they are all behind Netanyahu on this. No, there is no disunity in Israel. This is not a left-right issue at all in Israel. Israel has never been more unified from left all the way to right. But according to this professor in Canada, probably there's a, an ulterior motive. What the hell would the ulterior motive be? Israel was so eager to hand off Gaza to Hamas that they literally ignored every single sign that Hamas was preparing this military attack for 20 years because they didn't want to be in there. And this dolt is out there saying things like, well, you know, you know, when it comes to when it comes to right intent, they might not have right intent. They really might want to build like beach houses in Gaza. Uh huh. Sure. Sure. He says the Israeli government does satisfy the criterion of having legitimate authority because it was democratically elected. The criterion of net benefit weighing the gain against the harm would include the potential gain of removing Hamas from power or at least neutralizing its capacity to attack Israel in the short term. The war might also provide new opportunities for the Palestinian Authority or some other transitional administration to govern Gaza and eventually free and fair elections. Israel might also be able to rescue hostages held by Hamas. However, the enormous loss of Palestinian lives will most likely create intergenerational rage. You're right. There hasn't been intergenerational rage ever since 1948. Everybody's been perfectly happy until now, until Israel had to go in and womp Hamas. Nailed it. Further, there is great risk of a wider war with fire already being exchanged over Israel's borders with Lebanon and Syria. So yeah, the, the best thing for Israel to do would be nothing, apparently. He says, the downside of Israel's war outweighs any benefits. Uh-huh. And then he says, the criterion of last resort is key to all just war considerations. Force should only be used when all other means have failed or would be clearly ineffective. Israel sees no other way to neutralize Hamas and rescue the hostages. But it has forsworn to wreck negotiations out of hand and is not considering a peace process for Gaza. Oh, so according to this professor, Israel should negotiate with Hamas. This is, this is insanity. By the way, under this guy's criteria, there has literally never been a just war raged by a Western power ever in history, ever. Literally ever. World War II is not justified because after all, the United States, was it really necessary for us to attack Japan after they attacked us? We could have negotiated with them. Was it really necessary for the United States to involve itself in literally any war? Any? By this criteria? Of course, the answer is no. Which means that this is a, it's a lie. And this guy knows it's a lie, but he's promoting it anyway. By the way, we now have a piece from the Washington Post 
that has serious evidence of what Hamas was attempting to do? And the answer is they were attempting to start a vast conflagration that was going to extend all the way to Judea, Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, and start a three front war against Israel at the same time. By the way, in the middle of this piece, buried in this Washington Post piece, is an admission that Hamas not only raped people, but actually had a commander of rape. They appointed a person who is in charge of delegating people for rape. They issued orders to their terrorists that said in Arabic, transliterated Hebrew, it said on their orders, orders to women to take off their pants so that they could rape them. And that's, that's in the Washington Post article for all the denialists who are suggesting that no rape took place. I mean, it literally says in the middle of this of this article, quote, some of the most brutal attacks occurred in Barry, where militants cut open the belly of a pregnant woman and dragged her fetus onto the ground. In other towns, survivors told the parents being murdered in front of their children and children murdered in front of their parents. Other survivors described witnessing, witnessing sexual assaults, including rape. Apparently, and then they admitted that there were lots of non Hamas Palestinians who joined the raid. Not only that, it turns out that there were Gazan workers who had supplied them with the information, quote, to obtain detailed intelligence, Hamas deployed cheap surveillance drones to generate maps of the Israeli towns and military installations within a few miles of the $1 billion barrier system Israel built to wall off Gaza. The group elicited additional information from Gazan day laborers who were permitted to enter Israel for work. So Israel literally let in and paid the people who then spied on it to create this war. And then you have morons suggesting that the war is not just somehow. It's just, it's absolutely incredible. It's absolutely incredible. By the way, that last part is kind of important that Gazan civilians were involved in the planning of the attack and, in fact, in the carrying out of the attack. Why? Not because it justifies in any way the targeting of civilians. You target military targets, and if civilians are there, you then have to assess the cost and benefits of each military strike. To be pointed out at this point, Israel had hit, as of last Friday, 12,000 military targets in the Gaza Strip. They had dropped over 25,000 bombs in the Gaza Strip, and they had killed, by the Gazan Health Authority estimates, which are totally wrong, I'm sure, they had killed about 10,000 people Okay, that is not the way that a carpet bombing campaign would look in terms of casualty numbers. That is not a carpet, that, that is a targeted military campaign. Okay, but put that aside. What does that really say? What it says is whatever comes next is not going to be easy and it's not going to be quick. This notion that Israel can simply hand off the Gaza Strip to the self-governance of people who literally participated in the attack or who supported the attack or who cheered the attack is totally crazy. Again, it's part of the West's self-deception. On Palestinian TV, there's this grandmother who recently appeared on Palestinian TV. And here is what she had to say. She says, quote, those who do not have martyrs in their family have no homeland. Those who have no prisoner in their family have no honor. We have to fight the jihad for Palestine, our land. By Allah, the blood of our martyrs. I have 17 grandchildren and 65 grandchildren. By Allah, I will sacrifice them all for the sake of Palestine and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. I will sacrifice them wholeheartedly and happily. I told my children, my grandchildren, you are the price for our homeland. I give you to our homeland. She will literally get all of her children and grandchildren killed. Are those the kinds of people that, that Israel is supposed to hand over power to in the Gaza Strip when all of this is over? We'll get to that in just one second. First, Listen, sleep, not easy to come by these days. I rely very heavily on my Helix Sleep mattress. I've had my mattress for, I don't know, almost a decade at this point. It is fantastic. It was personalized for me. It was personalized for my wife because we kind of have different sleeping styles in terms of like soft or hardness in the mattress. Helix is now introducing their newest, most high-end collection, the Helix Elite. Helix Elite harnesses years of extensive mattress expertise to offer a truly elevated sleep experience. The Helix Elite collection includes six different mattress models, each tailored for specific sleep positions and firmness preferences. Go to helixsleep.com slash Ben to check out the new collection today. Nervous about buying a mattress online? Well, you don't have to be. Helix has a sleep quiz that matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress. Because why would you buy a mattress made for somebody else? I took that Helix quiz. I was mashed with a firm but breathable mattress, which is precisely what I need. If it's too soft, can't sleep. If it's too... If it's too warm, can't sleep either. Go to helixsleep.com slash Ben. Take that two-minute sleep quiz. Find the perfect mattress for yourself. Helix is offering 25% off all mattress orders plus two free pillows for our listeners in honor of Black Friday. Go to helixsleep.com slash Ben. Use code HELIXPARTNER25. It's their best offer yet. It's not going to last long with Helix. Better sleep starts right now. Also, despite the lackluster economy, the Daily Wire continues to thrive. We are currently hiring. We are currently looking to add an eager inside sales representative to our ad sales team. This position will be responsible for identifying new accounts and fostering relationships with clients. 
Knowledge of our brand as well as experience in digital media sales are required. If you match this description, we want to hear from you. The position is based in Nashville, Tennessee. If you're interested in joining our team, visit dailywire.com slash careers. That's dailywire.com slash careers today. Okay, meanwhile, as we have seen, I mean, the reality is that whatever happens next in Gaza is going to be deeply connected to Israeli security, obviously. This is why, again, what you are watching in terms of Middle Eastern policy has ramifications for America, has ramifications for Britain, has ramifications for the West. Because the entire MO of the West for literally decades has been you sleep, you go to sleep on the actual belief systems of billions of people across the planet so as to give yourself this wonderful utopian dream of a world where everybody thinks like you. And therefore, you can just import everybody to your shores. You can welcome them into MIT. You can welcome them into the centers of London. And you can fire anybody who says, wait a second, these people not only don't think like us, they wish to destroy our civilization. There are ramifications for not understanding the way the world works. And yet, so much foreign policy is predicated on all this. This isn't real politique. Okay, there is an aspect of real politique where even American allies get forced into positions that they don't want to be in because it is in, quote unquote, America's interest. But that is not what's happening here. What is currently happening here is that Israel is seeking to annihilate an actual terror group and then replace that with a secure situation for itself. And meanwhile, you have the West saying, no, no, no. What you really need to do is you need to hand over control of that situation to a bunch of people who will then repeat this afterward. So, for example, Jake Sullivan, who's the actual NSA advisor, he says there, there can't be any reoccupation of Gaza. OK, what is his alternative? Seriously, I, I want to know the alternative. Is the alternative to hand it over to the Palestinian Authority? You have multiple problems with that. Problem number one, Palestinian Authority is a group of liars. The head of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, is an actual honest to God Holocaust denier. His actual government, by law, pays people who murder Jews. That is, they are just a difference in degree, not a difference in kind from Hamas. Two, the Palestinian Authority has no internal ability to control. They are not in control of Judea and Samaria, the Palestinian Authority. You, you have Lion's Den, which is a terror group, which has been doing enormous amounts of harm in the West Bank. Islamic Jihad, incredibly active in the West Bank. Hamas's goal, by the way, when it, invaded, when it invaded, tried to get all the way to the West Bank so as to start a conflagration in the West Bank in which the Palestinian Authority would be overturned. The reason there's been no election in Judea and Samaria, in the Palestinian areas of Judea and Samaria, for literally 15 years at this point is because Mahmoud Abbas and the PA are deeply afraid that if an election were held, Hamas would win. So turning this territory over to the tender mercies of the PA is absurd. It's not going to happen and it's unrealistic. So what are the other alternatives? You can't turn over to the UN because the UN is a garbage heap of extraordinary proportions. The UN, let us forget, lest we forget, was supposed to guarantee peace on Israel's northern border in southern Lebanon. After the 2006 Israel war in southern Lebanon, Israel turned over that border area to UNIFIL. The UN promptly allowed Hezbollah to come in and arm the entire border with 200,000 rockets. The UN RWA has not only facilitated, they have advanced the cause of Islamic extremism in the Gaza Strip and Judea and Samaria. The UN cannot be trusted. That is not a trusted source. So it can't be the UN and it can't be the PA. Who the hell would it be? Egypt doesn't want it. Israel might be able to trust Egypt to run the Gaza Strip. They've offered it to them a thousand times. So you know what Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, the leader of Egypt said, the dictator of Egypt said, he was asked by Israel, will you take the Gaza? He said, I will not take one Palestinian, zero. And they were asked why. And he said, because I know these people, I'm not taking them. The same thing in Jordan, where Queen, Queen Rania is crying salty tears. Oh, she's so sad over what's happening in the Gaza Strip. I don't see Jordan offering to take anybody. There's a reason for that. Queen Rania, despite being a Palestinian Arab herself, is perfectly happy to marry into the Hashemite dynasty, a colonial outpost left over from the British mandate. And she's happy to go to five-star hotels. She's happy to live in palaces while her people live on 4,100 bucks a year. And meanwhile, she sits there and she complains, but she's not willing to take in any Palestinian refugees. Why? Because she's afraid she'll be overthrown. That's why. Everybody knows this. So there is no one who's willing to do this, which means the only alternative, realistically speaking, is for an Israeli military presence to guarantee Israeli security because it's on Israel's border. OK, so Netanyahu said this the other day and Jake Sullivan was like, no, there will be no reoccupation. OK, fine. You we're wait. We're all ears. Seriously, you, everyone, everyone in the West, all ears got some solutions. Let's hear them. I think Israel will, for uh, an indefinite period, will have the overall uh, security responsibility because we've seen what happens when we don't have it. So, so what? What do you? What's your take on that? I mean, he's, he's also later said they don't seek to govern Gaza, but that sounds like an Israeli occupation of Gaza. Is 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 that is that where this is going? 
That is not our understanding of the Israeli government's position, and I think Prime Minister Netanyahu has clarified his comments, as you, as you just alluded to. The American position on this is straightforward. Secretary Blinken laid it out this past week. No reoccupation of Gaza, no reduction in the territory of Gaza, no forcible displacement of Palestinians, and Gaza should never be allowed to be used as a base for terrorist attacks against Israel or anyone else. Okay, so obviously it's going to have to be it's going to have to be Israeli security control. And all this happy talk about it not being is ridiculous on its face. Now, listen, I don't want to make it seem as though the Hamas supporters are winning everywhere. They're not. I mean, the fact is there are lots and lots of people across the West who support Israel in its, in its attempts to take Hamas off the, off the game board. There, there are tons of people. Yesterday, in a very encouraging show, there are over 100,000 people who marched in Paris. You'll notice I'm, I'm seeing um, a very different demographic profile for the people who are marching against Hamas, for the people who are marching pro-Hamas. That doesn't have to do with race. That has to do with country of origin and ideology attached thereto. In any case, here's what some of that march looked like in France. The, by the way, the far left group didn't participate. Every other group in France, every other political body joined this march, not the far left. The far left said we will not. 100,000 people joining in this march against anti-Semitism. Now, by the way, if you'd actually like to fight anti-Semitism, that means you need to let Israel fight the new Nazis who are Hamas. You have to point out that it is not just Hamas, it is also Hezbollah. Hey, it turns out that, that fighting anti-Semitism is more than just a few pretty words, but we should at least, we should at least provide the, the optimistic news that there are people across the world who support Israel in their battle against Hamas. That is good. Meanwhile, it, it turns out that some rich people are starting to get the news about how terrible the university system is, which is presumably why 1,600 Jewish Harvard alum are threatening to withdraw their donations over concerns about anti-Semitism, according to CNN. Members of the Harvard College Jewish Alumni Association wrote a letter to the president of the college saying, we never thought that at Harvard, we would have to argue the point that terrorism against civilians demands immediate and unequivocal condemnation. We never thought we would have to argue for recognition of our own humanity. Well, I'm glad to see that people are waking up. I'm glad to see that uh, there are some people on the left of the Jewish community who have finally realized that it turns out the far left and their intersectional coalition, they are not your friends at all, at all. OK, in just one second, we'll get to breaking news in the 2024 Republican side of the presidential campaign. First, let's talk about how you stay healthy. OK, so vegetables, not my friend. I've talked about this before. Don't like how they taste. Blech. And God's revenge on humanity. They're very healthy for you. And um, he didn't make them taste like steak, unfortunately. Well, how exactly do I fill that gap? The answer is balance of nature. Balance of nature fruits and veggies are a great way to make sure you're getting essential nutritional ingredients every single day. Balance of nature uses an advanced cold vacuum process that encapsulates fruits and veggies into whole food supplements without sacrificing their natural antioxidants. The capsules are completely void of additives, fillers, extracts, synthetics, pesticides, or added sugar. The only thing in balance of nature's fruit and veggie capsules are, you know, like the fruits and the veggies. There's never been an easier way to make sure you're getting your daily dose of fruits and veggies. Balance of Nature sent a bunch of fruit and veggie capsules down to the studio for my team to try. Everybody is feeling brighter, healthier, more energetic. I love Balance of Nature because it helps make my busy schedule much more manageable. Producer Zach actually brings his Balance of Nature fruits and veggies with him on the road, which is how he is staying alive. He's got a busy schedule. Go to balanceofnature.com. Use promo code Shapiro for 35% off your first order as a preferred customer. That's balanceofnature.com. Promo code Shapiro. Get 35% off your first preferred order. Also, for most homeowners, window replacement, that's not something that you've done before, right? You just moved into your house or your apartment, wherever it is, and uh, the windows are there and you just kind of leave them. For a lot of other people, it's not something that you want to do, but something you have to do because the window cracked or something. Well, here's the thing. You need to call Renewal by Anderson. Have you put off replacing those windows because it's too expensive? Good news. You can get a free in-home window consultation and free quote from Renewal by Anderson. Renewal by Anderson's signature service is committed to giving you the best customer experience possible, supported by the best people in the industry. I've actually known the people at Renewal by Anderson for, I don't know, a decade at this point right now, Renewal by Anderson is offering a free in-home or virtual consultation on durable quality, affordable windows or patio doors for $0 down, zero payments, zero interest for one year. Text Shapiro to 200-300 for your free consultation. Save 375 bucks off every window, 750 bucks off every door. These savings won't last long. Be sure to check it out. Text Shapiro to 200-300. That's Shapiro to 200-300. Texting privacy policy in terms and conditions posted at textplans.us. Texting enrolls for recurring automated text marketing messages. Message and data rates may apply. Reply stop to opt out. Go to windowappointmentnow.com for full offer details. Okay, meanwhile, the 2024 race on the Republican side is beginning to consolidate. So Tim Scott, senator from South Carolina, who had failure to launch right from the outset of his campaign. Very nice guy. No reason he was running for president. He has now bowed out. Here he was yesterday announcing it on Fox News. 
But when I go back to Iowa, it will not be as a presidential uh, candidate. I am suspending my campaign. I, I think the voters uh, who are the most remarkable people on the planet have been really clear that they're telling me uh, not now, Tim. I don't think they're saying, Trey, no, but I do think they're saying not now. And so I'm going to respect the voters and I'm going to hold on and keep working really hard and uh, look forward to another opportunity. Hey, so he's out. He didn't have a lot in the polling. He was about 7% in Iowa, which is interesting because that support is going to go somewhere. Nationally speaking, he was in sixth place behind like Chris Christie. So him dropping out is not a big note. It just means some of his donors are not going to put their money behind him anymore because he had originally sucked up a lot of cash. That means there are only five people who are left in the race at this point. Trump, who's way out in the lead. Ron DeSantis in solid second. Nikki Haley, who's drawing up behind DeSantis. Vivek Ramaswamy, who's sticking around for the plaudits and the bleeps and the giggles. And Chris Christie, who's out there as some sort of revenge tactic that no one really understands because he's one of the angriest people in American politics. So one of the big questions here is which way Tim Scott's support actually goes. So again, Tim Scott is from South Carolina. You have to imagine that him being out is going to help Nikki Haley in South Carolina, particularly. Him being out in Iowa, not clear which way Scott's support is going to go. If you added it to DeSantis, then DeSantis is now in the mid-20s. If you split it between DeSantis and Haley, then DeSantis is at like 20, 21%. Haley would be at maybe 17% in Iowa. Kind of the, the smart money suggests that most of Scott's support is going to go to Haley because he was very much like-minded with her on a lot of various issues. And also because, again, he's from South Carolina. He's seen as sort of the nice guy in the campaign, which is more the preserve of Nikki Haley than it is of Ron DeSantis. We haven't really seen a lot of new polling out of Iowa since the governor of Iowa, Kim Reynolds, announced her support for Ron DeSantis, where that's going to move the, the needle at all in that state. Basically, the only way that this race even gets interesting is if DeSantis wins Iowa. If DeSantis loses Iowa to Trump, it's over. If Trump wins Iowa, I mean, it's probably over anyway, but if Trump wins Iowa, he's going to run the table. If he loses Iowa, then there's the possibility that you could see DeSantis strengthened in New Hampshire and Haley strengthened in New Hampshire. Here's the theoretical possibility. Theoretical possibility, DeSantis wins Iowa, Haley wins New Hampshire, and then he moved down to South Carolina. And now that Scott is out, who's eating up a lot of the vote, and Haley, who's the former governor, is there, a lot of that support then swivels over to Haley and it turns into sort of a three-person race from there on out. Now, by the polling data, that doesn't seem the most plausible at this point, if you look at the polling in Iowa, the Real Clear Politics polling average has Trump up at 47%. DeSantis, Haley, Scott combined were at like 39%. So they weren't actually up at Trump's level, but it is a caucus state. If you look at New Hampshire, Trump has a wide lead over the rest of the field. He's at 47%. Haley's at 15. DeSantis at 11. Christie is at 9. If Christie were to drop out, that might make the race a little bit more interesting over there. There is no polling, so far as I'm aware, from South Carolina anytime in the recent past. So we don't actually know how that would look in the primaries. But the field had to consolidate, at least for there to be a chance that somebody could take on Trump. And uh, the field is consolidating. So, you know, good for Tim Scott for stepping out when this was no longer a campaign worth running. I'm waiting for Chris Christie and Vivek Ramaswamy to realize the same, because, again, there's no reason for them to be in the race. Meanwhile, Donald Trump is making the rounds. His campaign to this point has basically featured him going to sporting events and UFC fights and getting cheers and some booze. And, uh, and then him ranting about his court cases. And honestly, like, if that's what the campaign is, uh, all right. I mean, okay. As long as the focus remains on Joe Biden and him being a very bad president, I think that, that Trump has a very solid shot at winning the presidency right now. The big problem is that, again, that should be where the focus is. Okay, so the, the amount, I think that people should understand the amount of hatred that Trump draws is entirely con concomitant with the amount of love that he draws. So listen, a lot of people love Trump for sure. Also, an enormous number of people hate Trump. This was made perfectly apparent the other night. He showed up at a UFC fight. He was flanked by uh, Tucker Carlson. So Tucker showed up with him, spurring all sorts of rumors about the possibility that Tucker was going to run as his VP. I think that's very unlikely. I don't think that's a job that Tucker even wants, but it spurred a lot of those sorts of rumors, especially because Trump had been asked about it. And he was like, maybe, maybe. Well, Trump says maybe to a lot of things. In any case, they both showed up. Here's what it looked like when they walked in. How strong that team is. Making his way. Martial arts fans, I know President Donald Trump taking his octagon side seat for UFC. Kid Rock is, is right next to him as well. Maybe Kid Rock will, will run for VP. You never know. Now, that could be a possibility. So obviously the crowd loves it. This is this is like Trump's core crowd. A lot, lot of macho in the room. A lot, lot, of, lot of dudes in the room. Like the, this is 
This is where Trump is very popular. Well, he was very popular except for like one human. So it turns out that Bill Burr, the comedian who has a new movie out, he was also at the UFC fight and he was there with his wife. His wife is sort of a Black Lives Matter activist. And um, and here is what it looked like when she flipped him off on the big screen. So you can see her behind him. She, she flips a double bird at Trump uh, as uh, as he moves into his row. Now, this spurred all sorts of conversations online. There, there are a couple points we made here. One is that, again, there are a lot of people who really hate Donald Trump. It is not just that there are a lot of people who love Donald Trump. There are. There are also a lot of people who really hate Donald Trump. He's a very, very polarizing figure. This is why, by polling data, generic Republican beats the pants off Joe Biden. And Donald Trump is running pretty even with Joe Biden in most of the polling. If you look at the real clear politics betting averages right now, Trump is up slightly on Biden in the betting averages. If you look at the real clear politics general election matchup average, it shows that Trump is up very, very slightly on Joe Biden, like within margin of error, 45.6% to 44.5%. In other words, pretending it's like a foregone conclusion that Trump's going to be Biden, that's not true. Now, Trump could be Biden for sure, but is it a foregone conclusion? Not clear. And if we get a year of Donald Trump ranting about his court cases and the media swivel, as they undoubtedly will, to cover Trump so as to avoid covering Biden, that's going to be a problem. The more Trump is in the headlines, the worse it is for him. The more Joe Biden is in the headlines, the better it is for Donald Trump. So again, point number one is that when you see this lady flipping off Donald Trump, a lot of us on the right are like, what a what a horse's ass. Like, really? He's at a UFC fight. Seriously? Like, really? And um, there are a lot of people who, are, meanwhile, are cheering her. Second point here is that, man, Bill Burr, I got to say, so personal point on Bill Burr. So Bill Burr, one of my favorite comedians, really funny. If you've watched any of his specials, they're hilarious. One of the best working comedians out there. I went to a show that Bill Burr did down here in Florida last week. He did it with the Hard Rock Cafe at, at the uh, Hard Rock Casino, like 7,000 seats. And Bill Burr, I think that he realizes that a lot of his crowd are people who are center, center, right? And I think he's uncomfortable with that. I think he's deeply uncomfortable with that. I think partially it's because, again, he's married to somebody who is very much on the left. And so he decided that he was going to come to Florida, an extremely red state, and not only insult the audience as a bunch of hick racists, but he was then going to make just a series of jokes about how America is dominated by white supremacy. And man, he died on stage. I mean, he was angry at the audience. He, he, was, he was up there. He had done the same routine, I assume, in Atlanta, like the night before or something. And every joke he told just fell absolutely flat. And he was relegated to kind of telling old, dirty stories. This is what happens when you are captured by your ideological crew. It's a real problem for a lot of comedians. A lot of comedians, particularly ones who have some sort of sort of center, center-right crowd. Jim Gaffigan's another example of this. At a certain point, they realize that there are a lot of people who might not vote like they do, and they get really uncomfortable with it. And they start to actively virtue signal about how those are not my people. I don't like those people. Well, you can play that game. But it turns out a lot of those people can be very turned off. There are a lot of people who like Trump and voted for Trump and probably will vote for Trump again if he's the nominee. Who saw Bill Burr's wife flip off the camera and then they're going to hear Bill Burr's latest routines, which are all about the inherent evil of the United States. I mean, that's literally what he was talking about the other night. And are going to turn off. That is a career risk for people. And I know that for people who live in LA and want to be, and they want their friend group to respect them, the thing it's necessary to do this, it really, really is not. It really is not. And entertainers are making a very large scale error when they do this sort of stuff. Okay, so anyway, Trump shows up, gets a big cheer. Again, this is what Trump is great at. He's great at drawing a uh, spotlight. He's great at, at being a celebrity. It's the thing he's best at. When it comes to campaigning, he's very distractible, easily distractible, like the dog and up distractible. Like Donald Trump, he'll be talking about Joe Biden's a terrible president, terrible president. And then out in the background pops a thought. And the thought is about like Letitia James or the thought is about Chris Christie. And it's like, squirrel, squirrel. And he just starts chasing after the squirrel like the dog from up. So um, here he was campaigning the other night and he just decides that he's going to, you know, go off on Chris Christie. For an, I don't like why. Is there a point to this? Like Chris Christie is, he's gathering like, he's gathering mold in this campaign. He has, he has no voters. Who said that? Who said that? And by the way, there's somebody else said something. They said, this man said something he shouldn't say. I will defend. He said, Chris Christie is a fat pig. You, you cannot say that, sir. You can. Please, please take that back. 
Please take that back. No, 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 no. He said Chris Christie's a fat pig. You cannot do that. Okay, like, really? Okay, and then, just to... Just to <laughs> that's not even his best. I mean, if you're going to go after Chris Christie, sometimes Trump's insult comedy shtick, like the Triumph, the insult comedy dog, sometimes that shtick is great. I mean, you remember a few weeks ago, he was going after how Biden walks. Like, he looks like he walks in toothpicks. And it's true. Like, now, you, every time I see Biden walk, I'm like, Trump is right. It does look like he's walking on toothpicks. It's weird. But Christie being a fat pig, like, eh. Then Trump decided he was going to talk about being a proud election denier. Which again, if we run on this, if Republicans run on this in 2024, it's going to go precisely the same way it's gone in 21, 2021, 2022, and 2023. It's not going to go amazing. So again, like this is not the imagery that you want if you're if you're the president, former president of the United States running again, is you double screened with Mike Lindell, the My Pillow guy, next to you got next to you who's like lost a lot of his fortune pursuing your specious claims about election election stealing. Uh, here is Donald Trump. Like tens of millions of people within our nation, I'm proud and strong. Election, I'm a very proud election denier. Okay, so um, is that something you want to run on? Also, uh, on Veterans Day, he tweeted out, we pledge to you that we will root out the communist Marxists, fascists, and radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country that lie and steal and cheat on elections. They'll do anything, whether legally or illegally, to destroy America and to destroy the American dream. Okay, now, I'm perfectly fine with him, quote unquote, rooting out communist Marxist, fascists, and radical left thugs. The problem is when he uses the, the language live like vermin. Like, again, I think we should deport an enormous number of people who support terrorism. I think there are a lot of people who are living in this country who are not citizens who should go back to their countries of origin. The language of vermin is not particularly smart political language. But again, you know, is that going to like hurt Trump in any real way? I don't think it's going to hurt Trump in any real way. It's just another distraction. Again, the story should be here that Joe Biden is very bad at the presidenting. Uh, and then on top of that, so I will say there was one unfair hit on Trump, media hit on Trump yesterday. And that was that Trump was speaking and he mixed up who the president was. Eh. I know they're trying to now create a narrative where Donald Trump is as senile as Joe Biden, but uh, that, that dog ain't going to hunt. So he doesn't have crime and he doesn't have the problems that they're having in other countries where millions of people are allowed to go in. But they uh, were interviewing him two weeks ago and they said, uh, what would you advise President Obama? The whole world seems to be exploding and imploding. And he said, it's very simple. He should immediately resign and they should replace him with President Trump, who kept the world safe. And I'm not just talking the United States. OK, so um, because he said Obama rather than Biden, I- I'm sorry, that that is not remo- the media went nuts over this. Because, again, they're now trying to undo the thing. The thing is that you're running an 80 year old guy who clearly is not functional. Trump mixing up Obama and Biden. I've done that before on the show because, frankly, they have the exact same staff. And Obama was the last Democratic president before this. That's really silly. So tr- trying to suggest that this is because Trump is losing it or something is purely ridiculous. All right, guys, the rest of the show is continuing right now. You're not going to want to miss it. We'll be getting into a breaking story in which Secret Service agents actually had to open fire after some people tried to break into an unmarked Secret Service vehicle. These were agents protecting Naomi Biden, the president's daughter. If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro. Check out for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description. (laughs) 